Right, I hope for our first speaker of the day is David York, uh, who's one of the original members of BrickPave. Uh, he's going to uh, take us down memory lane, tell us why we were set up, and also give us some pointers for the future. David. Thanks, Steve, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's uh, a real pleasure to see faces I haven't seen for quite a while now, and some new ones as well. Um, yeah, 30 years. Um, it's uh, quite a while ago, and it's probably a good time just to have a look at some of the things that happened all that, year, uh, all that time ago. So Brian I Adams was top of the pops with his record, I Do It For You. Soviet Union breakup, when Mr. Gorbachev um, decided enough was enough. First Gulf War, um, started, finished, and the breakthrough in the Channel Tunnel. And I think it's just useful to set our minds back to the time. It's a long, long time ago. I realised this morning that what I ought to have done was to put up here what big uh, construction projects were at the time, but I didn't, <coughs> and I can't remember. So uh, Brit Brave was the brainchild of uh, Brian Walker, uh, a very dear man, a lovely man, uh, and I'll always be grateful to him and my good friend John Kennedy uh, for putting my name forward as a possible first council member. Um, so British Cement Association, I, I think, had... Uh, seen that they could do with an organisation to push concrete roads uh, at the time because concrete roads weren't popular. Um, and it was originally set up as to be a contractor organisation uh, in the belief that um, they would be the ones to push concrete road, uh, the benefits and so on, and try and get Highways England at the time to specify more of them or permit more of them. Um, so this, uh, I put down this list of the original contractors, and at the bottom there's me. I remember going to the first meeting when Mike Welton, who was the uh, MD of Balfour Beatty at the time, chaired the meeting. And there's Patrick Fitzpatrick, and there's directors from all these other contractors, and there's a one-man band of <laughs> me, and I'm thinking, what the hell am I doing amongst this lot here? But um, I was well accepted, I was treated with respect, and um, after a few meetings, and I got to know one or two of them uh, over the coffee and so on afterwards, I remember one day coming to a meeting and Pat Fitzpatrick said to me, Hello, David, how are you? And I said, to be honest, Pat, I've been suffering. I've got these bloody Judean ulcers. Get yourself down to Harley Street, my boy. I'll tell you the name of the guy to go and see. I said, I can't afford to go to Harley Street. But he, he put me onto a drug called Tagamet, which cured me. Um, so I've got happy memories of those uh, first days. Um, the objective, of course, was to put any competitiveness aside. This was really about trying to create a market that everyone could benefit from. <coughs> and within a, a year or so, it the decision was made, well, you know, contract is great, but the industry is much more about consultants, suppliers, um, specialist contractors and so on. And so we decided to broaden the church and invite new members. And the strategy was to establish an organisation as a source of technical excellence um, and to make a difference to really try and get uh, some improved market for concrete roads. And as part of that, it was important to set up task groups to look at the different specialities within the organization and the different markets that could potentially be opened up. Uh, I was fortunate to be on the Rhodes Task Group looking at CBMs at the time. And since then, uh, BritPave, as we all know, has produced this fantastic library of documents that have been so effective um, for all kinds of people, not just our, uh, our uh, customers, the various client bodies, and private developers who, who've used the things, but also within the organizations that are members, for younger members, uh, for, as a source of learning. They have been fantastic. One of the uh, great successes, of course, was BritPave Barrier. Um, I remember when uh, the initial idea was set up and we were looking at barriers in America and around Europe and eventually chose this section. And as we all know, it subsequently uh, was approved 
and as we drive up and down uh, motorways, I, I, I always, when I'm driving up and down anyway, and I see them, I always, yeah, it was great to be involved in that. Of course, that's been hived off as a separate entity now. <coughs> and I think at this point, it's very important to recognise that there, there aren't paid individuals other than Steve and Bev. Is Bev, Bev not in the room? She's uh, holding the whole place well, I just think it would be appropriate for us all to say thank you because I think you do a really, really, really fantastic job, the pair of you, in, uh, in managing the system. Um, so they're the only paid people and uh, everyone else who gets involved is on an unpaid basis. And I think that was once estimated to be worth around half a million pounds a year, which is pretty special, I think. Uh, and all this has led up to BritPave today, uh, being recognised as a, a centre of excellence. Uh, technically, so sound, um, client bodies believe what we say and are prepared to engage with us, which is fantastic. And the future. Well, it's OK looking back the last 30 years and all the things that have happened in the past, but the future is what we're here to tackle now can't change what's happened in the past, we can reflect on it. But carbon has got to figure in our, our future and what we do, how we're going to tackle things. <coughs> and where can Brit pay fit in? Well, we know that concrete roads can offer significant benefits in this area. Um, the carbon footprint of cement production has dropped by 53% since 1990. And I think at this point it's also important to say, I don't know if anyone's picked it up, uh, but Ribblesdale Cement Works has just declared net zero. So its fuel sources are from abattoir, remains, uh, various other sources of um, industrial output, and they're able to declare that they have no net carbon uh, output, which is a fantastic change. These things won't be cheap, but we can sit on our backsides and think, well, somebody else can do it. But the fact is that climate change is here with us and we have to tackle things, we have to bite the bullet and be prepared to pay more for some of the things that we do, I guess. I think the other thing uh, I'd just say at this point on that same subject is that the fuel input's one thing, <coughs> but there's also technology around to capture emissions from things like power stations, energy from waste plants, and maybe cement works and uh, asphalt plants. There's a technology to take those emissions, put them through an electrolyzer, and actually produce hydrogen. Hydrogen, I think, has got a lot to play in the future, but if you can take your emissions, take the carbon out of the system and produce a, a fuel, a green fuel, whose emissions, when you use them, are only water, what a fantastic thing that would be to do. So the other things on concrete roads that can contribute is reduce rolling resistance. And if we can make a 7% fuel saving on our uh, diesel trucks, because, you know, like it or not, we can't make the change instantly. Diesel trucks are going to be here for a while. Electric trucks, I don't think so. I think every goods vehicle, you'd need, a, you'd need a battery the size of a transit van. And it's gone 200 miles down the road, needs to recharge. How long is that going to take? They? I just don't think it's practical, so we need to get over that. There's another uh, um, potential um, benefit here where there's developing concretes that would absorb um, exhaust pollutants using titanium dioxide. I don't know too much about that, but it, I do know that it's happening. Um, and we've got things like self-healing -he concrete, another development that could have benefits. And very importantly, and it's just been, Joe mentioned it, the, the whole life cost, not just in financial terms, but in carbon terms, 50-year life for a concrete road, that must be a big benefit. And it's something that we can flag up and compare against asphalt, for instance, and we're, we're definitely in the good place. And as I mentioned earlier, I think the current fad for electric vehicles, I think at best it's a stopgap. Because people who think that when they charge their car, um, an electric vehicle or a hybrid or whatever, they're not um, 
making any emissions, well, of course, the fact is that they just move the emissions back to a power station somewhere. And that's the root cause is what we need to tackle. So I think hydrogen uh, offers better prospects, but it's a chicken and egg thing. Vehicle manufacturers, and you can make um, hydrogen fuel cells for planes, trucks, ships, whatever you want to, and they will work, they will produce the power. Um, so we can do those things. They are there, hydrogen can work, but it's this chicken and egg. Vehicle manufacturers will make cars and trucks <coughs> if the hydrogen's available. And I guess the, the, on the other side, hydrogen um, would be, could be produced by converting some of these emissions uh, into being electrolyzed, for example. But our company is going to make that investment if there aren't the hydrogen-powered vehicles to take the fuel at the end of the day. So it's chicken and egg. The government needs to take this by the scruff of the neck and um, start sponsoring somehow, giving tax benefits or uh, investing in pilot scale schemes to, to approve the system. Anyway, whichever of these power sources is used, the benefits for concrete roads are going to be there. We're still going to need trucks. I don't see us having Star Trek technology to beam goods from one place to another, not for a little while. Um, so we're still going to need trucks. What they're powered by, whether it's diesel or electric or hydrogen, the benefits of concrete roads stand there to be proven. Um, and there's, of course, there's other marketplaces that we're involved in as well um, at, at BrickPave. And there'll still be the same kind of benefits to put forward, the whole life cost for carbon, uh, and, and so on. And BritPave is surely going to be there to see that they're all due recognized. recognized. Um, a few thank yous, and I need to get a piece of paper up now because my memory's not what it used to be. Not that one. Not that one. It's here somewhere. <laughs> I hope. So we thanked Steve and Bev. Um, but I think it's appropriate as well to recognize that for a long time, David Jones was manager of the organization, and he did a superb job. So he, he's not here, but I think it ought to be recorded. And later on, Ellie, his assistant, she also um, did a lot of work, particularly for the barrier. Um, I'd like to thank all council members, current and past, for steering the ship and getting us to a good place. And also task group members, because without their enthusiasm and efforts and so on, a lot of the technical uh, outputs wouldn't have been possible. They, they put in a lot of work to do those things. And finally, of course, um, funders, cement companies mainly, I guess, um, memberships and so on, because without funds, as we all know, you don't get much done. Things don't happen for, for nothing. That's my uh, presentation. Thank you.